Hello, this is Willard Watson, Programs and Outreach Director at the Blowing Rock Art History Museum. And today, we're going to listen to an interview with Mark Gardner. Mark Gardner is one of the featured artists in our Branching Out Works in Wood for North Carolina exhibition. Uh, Mark was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, and woodworking was his father's hobby. And he was introduced to woodworking through him, but it wasn't until he attended a two-week class at Aramont School of Arts and Crafts in 1996 that Mark was hooked on the the wood turning process. He then moved to Saluda, North Carolina in 2000 and has since focused on woodworking. He finds inspiration in much of his decorative work from his interest in mid-century modern design. His sculpture is inspired by oceanic and African art and there is a looseness to oceanic and African forms and carvings that he admires. Mark finds it a stretch to incorporate some of the looseness that he loves from oceanic and African art into his sculpture, but it finds it well worth his effort creatively. So I hope you enjoy this talk with Mark. So my first question is, how did you start working with wood? And was there anyone in particular that taught you? Yeah, uh, well, uh, woodworking was my father's hobby. He was an avid furniture maker, a hobbyist. So he got me interested um, when I was a teenager, really. And then when I turned 16, I was old enough to start taking classes. So I started taking a furniture class at the University of Cincinnati. <clears throat> and um, I wound up really enjoying it and taking it all through the rest of high school and all through college. I went to UC for, for my uh, uh, college education. And um, and it was uh, it was enjoyable. I liked making kind of simple shaker style uh, furniture. Um, through that, I was introduced to the lathe and turning, um, uh, making bowls and vases and things like that. Um, and then uh, that really piqued my interest because it was so fast, and you could make something in an hour or a day, and furniture making for me, it was very slow. I mean, I was a teenager, but still it would take me weeks to months, a year to make a piece of furniture. And, um, and the turning was so immediate. Um, so I, that, I really enjoyed trying to teach myself that, that skill. Uh, after I graduated college in 96, I went to Aramont School for Arts and Crafts in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Took a turning class there with John Jordan, who's a really well-known Wood turner, uh, known for these um, beautifully turned and carved and embellished uh, vases and vessels, uh, lidded jars, really, really sweet uh, work. So I got to take a two week class with him, and I felt like that class uh, kind of set me on the path to, to want to be a full time woodworker. Um, I learned so much and I got so much better just with two weeks of instruction. Um, and so then uh, that was the summer after I graduated and I just got a BFA in theater design. And I thought I was gonna be building and painting sets, maybe become a set designer, go to grad school for that maybe. Um, but then after the class at Aramont, I just wanted to turn stuff on the way. So, uh, Worked in the theater in Cincinnati uh, in that in that world until and was a hobbyist wood turner until 2000 when I moved to Saluda where I live now. Um, I met uh, Stony Lamar, who's a sculptor and a wood turner. I met him through through John Jordan. They're good friends, and um, Stony was looking for help to get ready for Smithsonian craft show that spring. And I was self-employed and I was able to come down to Saluda and, and work with him for like, uh, four or six weeks, something like that. Uh, and I was a fan of his work. And so it was a real opportunity. I felt like it was a real opportunity for me. And, um, it was great. It was a great time. Uh, I have some welding skills I picked up in the theater and you know training in college and theater and he was starting to 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 marry wood forms his sculpted wood forms with these hollow uh fabricated constructed sheet metal forms so i was able to do all the welding and grinding and stuff 
for him. And so it just worked really well, I thought. And, um, uh, and then I met my wife in Saluda. She was uh, living and working in Saluda and I met her here. So that's what really, I mean, that's what tipped the scale. So I moved down here to be with her. Stoney allowed me to keep working out of his studio. Um, and I worked out of his studio for six years. And I can't imagine having started to work with sculpture seriously if I hadn't been in Stoney's shop. I was just, I was around it all the time. You know, I got to watch his process, which is very different from mine, but is very uh, satisfying uh, to be around, you know, um, and it just got, I think just being around all the time, I got to thinking about my own ideas sculpturally and what I wanted to try and what I had to do. And, um, and then, uh, I guess it was maybe an Oh four or five was when I really started focusing more on the sculpture, uh, and less on the turns, uh, work. Although a lot of those early sculptures were initially, pieces that started on the lathe and then were shaped and, and augmented later. Um, which is, it, which is very much how Stony works, you know, mm -hmm. and now the sculpture I'm making is much more direct carving, um, with the chainsaw and, and hand kind of held power to, Hey, Hey, handheld power tools and, um, uh, and that, yeah, that's where I, that's kind of where I am now. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's cool. And so one of my questions that I had prepared was if, uh, North Carolina's history as a hub of furniture making attracted you to this place. And I think it's interesting that, uh, you just told me, you know, that you started out in furniture design, but you found out that's not what you wanted to do. And then you came here and you, uh, started working with a uh, wood sculptor. So, um, yeah. Yeah, so the furniture really didn't have any kind of part, uh, anything to do with you being here, huh? No, not not in North Carolina. It was, the furniture was just my entry into the medium. Mm -hmm. uh, and so has uh, North Carolina in particular, you know, kind of, has the state shaped you in any way besides kind of like your uh, mentorship time uh, with uh, Stoney? Yeah, absolutely. I mean... I mean, when I started, I never thought, I, you know, I had no idea I was going to become so serious about wood turning when I started making furniture. Uh, and then when I started turning, I, it never occurred to me that I would wind up being a sculptor, you know. So just being around another full-time sculptor uh, uh, had a huge influence on me. And not just that, but uh, all the people that I met through Stoney in the wood and John Jordan in the wood turning and wood sculpting community had a huge impact on me because um, I was I was still very much enamored with the turning process uh, when kind of the generation before me of wood turners they were all becoming more sculptural in their approach and in their their uh, their work and Stoney's a, a great example of that Robin Horn Michael Peterson Todd Hoyer no, None of those people are from North Carolina, but there, there's kind of like this this group of uh, artists that are Stoney's age and John's age that were very much uh, concentrated. Their work concentrated on the lathe, uh, and then it seemed like all at once they kind of exploded out into much more sculptural uh, processes and, uh, and approaches. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. As far as North Carolina specific, I mean, I work with local woods. I mean, uh, and that was one of the greatest things for me. I mean, immediately there's, there's tons of trees in Cincinnati, but you're in a city and you don't have access to them. Like I've had access since I came here and we're, I mean, it feels like we're just a couple of plants shy of a rainforest. So the variety is really high, uh, and the availability, it's really easy to come by, um, in, in scale. And in quantity and that's definitely influenced my work because I wouldn't you know I was limited to what I could get you know from a, a you know a tree service I just happened upon that was taking down a neighborhood tree um, and here it just you know there's there's a log yard you just go to the yard and 
you can get huge logs and you can get them delivered. So, you know, just having access to that material has definitely influenced my work too. Uh, you know, and not just in scale, but just in the amount of work that I'm able to produce because I have kind of this almost unlimited supply of really good material. It would depend year to year. I would teach more or less, but there were some years I would be traveling at least once a month going somewhere to either teach a turning class or a carving class or a sculpting class, either at a, like a craft school like Penland or Aramont or um, at a local or regional wood turning group, you know, a club. Um, and I'm that, you know, since 2000, that's made up a, a fair portion of my income, you know, my livelihood. So, and it's something I really enjoy. Uh, my dad was an English uh, professor uh, aside from being a woodworker, and I like, I like the fact that I'm able to share what was shared with me. Um, most, you know, most people are good people to be around, and wood turners and woodworkers, that you know, they're the same. So, getting to go out and share this stuff is, uh, it's a treat. You know, it, it is. I mean, you get to be kind of the center of attention, which probably isn't bad either. You know, which I probably enjoy that if I was being honest but it's um it's really um uh you know I can never pay the people back that you know everything that John and Stoney and Robin these people have done for me uh and just in what they've shared with me and you know kind of the uh people that they've introduced me to or opportunities that I have been given because I know them or was introduced to these or these opportunities are presented to me because of them. So, you know, the, the next best thing I can do is try to, to, you know, pass that along, you know, as best I can. And the teaching is probably the best way to do that. Mm -hmm. So you've said that you're, you know, do you, you consider yourself a sculptor? Uh, and um, would you, do you make work that is functional? Uh, or do you just purely do sculptural work? Uh, no, I do. I make a lot of functional work. Um, I, I consider myself a woodworker when people ask me, I, mm -hmm. mostly because they know what that means. You know, they don't know what a wood turner is. Uh, and when you just say you're a wood sculptor, then that, that just sends you down the road of really, you know, you know, hard conversation to have. But uh, everybody knows who, what a woodworker does. And if we want to get more detailed, then I can talk about my work. Um, so I, that's how I like to see myself. Um, and I just, if anything, I've had a hard time deciding, you know, on one thing I'd like to do. So I still really enjoy turning. The process is really satisfying. Uh, I do a lot of um, production, functional salad bowls, uh, things you can eat out of, things you can serve out of. Uh, I have a few, a couple smaller kind of home decor items I sell through my website. Uh, not really furniture, but mirrors and kind of uh, sculptural shelves for the wall, things like that. Um, and then uh, that hopefully, well, the plan is that that allows me the time. The income from those things allow me the time. And, and since I'm in the shop and not out of the shop trying to make money, then um, I can steal a day or I can steal a couple hours at the end of a day and I can work on, um, one-off pieces or on a piece of sculpture or you know chase an idea that's been rattling around for a while um so it's still a it's it's still a mixed uh bag you know it's, it's rare that i would spend you know even an entire week working on sculpture you know i, I tend to fit that in around the other stuff right now mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and uh, that's that's something that I've heard echoed in other artists as well. You know, it's uh, a, a balance of the two. Um, and so let me see my next question. Um, so what's historically associated with men? And um, do you think that's still relevant today? Or do you notice any issues of diversity amongst wood artists, either in gender or race? Um. It's still, it's still pretty white male uh, centric, as far as I can tell. There's, a, there's the National Wood Turners Club or Association, and, and I'll get the percentage wrong, but it's like 90% white men 
um, very few women and very few mi mi minorities. And uh, and I, I don't I don't know. I mean, I there's probably lots of reasons why that is, and I don't know all the reasons. But I, you know, I think I think access is one thing. You know, um, being a white male in America, I have access to pretty much everything that even white women uh, don't have access to, and certainly uh, people of color don't have access to. Um, and it's I'm, I'm afraid it's been that way for so many generations now that that's why the disparity is there. Um, and I know that there's, um, there are tools in place in some of the institutions to try to remedy that disparity, but it's certainly gonna take a long time to, to get the numbers, you know, that, that are, you know, more, you know, even approaching some kind of equality or uh, something that's, that's similar to the population's, you know, uh, uh, dispersal or, I don't know the right word, but um, there has been, I mean, specifically on for women in woodworking in the last year, there's been uh, some good focus on them. There's There was a great exhibition at the Center for Art and Wood that was just focusing on women. Um, and then the last the last couple residencies that they've hosted, they, they have an annual residency every summer uh, in the last two or three years, it, the majority of the residents, I think it's five residents, woodworkers, woodturner, sculptors, um, the majority of those residents have been women. And I, I think that's, you know, encouraging. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and part of that residency, it's an international side to that. They try to get woodworkers from outside of the country to come, so it's not just all Americans. And it just depends on the year, you know. Uh, if there's not a lot of applicants from outside of the country, then they, they make do. But, um, you know, that, you know, that's one example that it's called the International Turning Exchange and the Center for Art and Wood uh, hosts it. And so to have, you know, uh, woodworkers from with different backgrounds and different cultures and different ethnicities coming to Philadelphia for this two month residency, I think that's one of those ways that, you know, those minorities, uh, uh, in the woodworking world, those numbers can start to, to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to have access to it. And uh, just, you said that, you know, some of your first experiences were woodworking with your father. Um, other people I've heard is like their first experiences were, you know, in a wood shop class in school. But a lot of schools mm -hmm. now don't have wood shop, right? So people having mm -hmm. access to those tools um, or the space to be able to do that safely. Uh, and so, or some people, it's they're saying their first time getting into it was when they were an art student in college and being mm -hmm. exposed to it. So yeah, a, lots of things about access that you know appear to be trending in the right direction. Um, so, is nature important to your work, either in subject matter or materials? And um, do you use found materials at all, or can you take me through how you choose what to use? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, sometimes the wood is is like a found object because not every log is the same. Um, you know, some sometimes it's just a round cylinder. You know, you get a log and it's a round cylinder, and sometimes I have an idea that that will that round cylinder will will, will work for, and I can impose my idea on that uh, on that bit of material. And then other times, uh, I hate to say that the material speaks to me, but that but just the shape of the material can influence a direction uh, that I might take. Um, and then and that's to me that's more exciting because it's there's there's more back and forth between me and the material. There's more give and take, and it's not uh, you know because once a piece is designed then it's kind of rote and you're just going through the motions to to produce that idea that was in your head or was on paper and not that that can't, there can't be a creative side to that process but for me it seems like i get more satisfaction out of it if there's uh there's more chances for the unexpected and if it's not if i'm not coming to the wood with a 
definite idea, but it's a vague idea or a direction. And then the, the shape of the wood and the nature of the material can, you know, can, um, can influence that. And, and to me, that's way more satisfying. Um, so as far as the nat nature goes, that's, that's where I see nature coming in and playing a role. Uh, it, it, it does in other ways too, you know, the, uh, some of the work I use just the, I'll steam the bark off of the piece and then I'll have just the natural surface of that under, you know, the, which is the outside of the log just beneath the bark. And that can be a really beautiful surface in and of itself. And it's a surface that's not handled, you know, that's not uh, manipulated by me, but I manipulate the wood around it to try to create effects. And, and so I will use, you know, nature in, in that way as well. Um, but as, but as far as like nature as uh, like part of uh, maybe a theme in my work or an idea that I'm trying to get across in the work, I don't, I don't think I work that way. Um, like if a piece has a title, typically that title comes at the end um, and maybe way after the end of making the, the piece where I've had uh, a lot of time to sit with it and percolate on it and um, and then, then I'll draw a connection between the piece and something in my life. So the idea of making a piece about nature isn't overt in my approach, but, um, but being that I try to leave some of the, the, a little bit of the rougher and natural side of the material there, uh, I wouldn't be bothered at all if, if someone were to, to glean some kind of, uh, natural meaning out of the, the work. I mean, that's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, one thing that you touched on, I think is interesting is just how the wood that cut that you have or the log that you have can influence what you do with it. And that mm -hmm. you're trying to, maybe it can inspire you or it can take you down certain directions or you might want to follow the, a certain grain or accentuate a burl or something like that. And how that can really uh, determine what you what your end product is. Um, and so I, I think that's cool that of the mediums um, that, you know, that we feature in the museum, uh, it's like wood is one of those where the medium kind of can influence the in final product more than other things like paints or fibers as much. Um, so yeah. I think it's really cool. And uh, do you have a favorite wood to work with? Uh. I think um, cherry is probably my favorite. It's just a really, well, it's, it, I really like the color of it. I think it's a beautiful tone, but then the density of it, the, the workability of it, you know, it's kind of, um, it's really forgiving. It's not too hard. It's not too soft. It's like right in the middle. Um, and it's also, I mean, not just the, the, the cherry color is, is I, I like, but the, the, the color of cherry is right in the middle of the value spectrum. Like walnut's very dark and that can be limiting. Uh, maple, which I use a lot of, is very white. And that to me has, can influence, you know, paint colors and finishing and, and those kinds of things. And I like the fact that cherry's right in the middle. And you can kind of almost go in any direction when it comes time to deciding burning and painting and finishing and that sort of stuff. Um, we don't have the best cherry. To, it doesn't grow here. It grows more up in Pennsylvania and New York, but um, I get a fair amount of it here and I'm happy when I, I get it, you know, there's, but again, being here, there's so, I'm, someone just gave me a, a dogwood tree, which is just beautiful material. I mean, it's hard and dense. It's great for, uh, small things. Uh, they used to make shuttles, uh, like for weavers, they would make the shuttle out of that because it was, it would wear so well. Um, actually Bradford pear, which I know people hate the Bradford pears. Uh, and I'm not crazy about the trees, but the wood is phenomenal wood. It's, it's almost like boxwood. Like it's, it's, it's like a poor man's boxwood, but just really even grained 
car turns, the car beautifully dies wonderfully, very crisp. Um, I mean, it doesn't get very big before, you know, the wind blows over, but, um, but those are, yeah, those three are really at the top. I mean, maple is what I get most of, a soft maple, like a red maple, grows here really well and grows really big. Um, and there isn't a great use for it commercially because it's not hard maple, sugar maple. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's often kind of considered a junk tree. You know. So if an arborist, if they know that I'm interested in it, at least there's an, I'm an outlet for them instead of driving it to the dump and paying to dump it. So I found, I get a lot of maple and it ma makes a great salad bowl, you know, and a big piece gives me options for, uh, for sculpture too. So, uh, lots of good, lots of good material here. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And, uh, I mean, again, your answer speaks like the diversity of the materials that are available, um, in the state and also those, none of the other artists I've spoken with have given me those responses. Everyone else was saying that uh, the most common one was mahogany. You know, it's mahogany and basswood and walnut are the answers that I've gotten either, uh, sure. you know, for people that actually have like a particular one. We have one artist that only works with plywood. He does laser cut uh, birch plywood. So he has a special source plywood that he goes with, but yeah, that's all yeah. he uses. Um, so yeah, it's just pretty, it's interesting how uh, different folks refer different uh, woods to work with. Now, yeah. could you tell me a little bit about the pieces that you have in our exhibit? Yes, you have, uh, let me see, you have a shadow type piece, the, the pear, that, that was kind of, that's, and I've done several in that, in that vein, but that series, I guess you call it, came about because those were kind of the cores of another piece. So those kind of tusk forms were cut out of a log in order to create something else. And then they hung around long enough for, for me to get interested in them. So I was making these kind of tall, long, kind of extruded forms, kind of like if you took a V and just extruded it out. And so to, to cut the core out, I would use a chainsaw and I'd cut in on either side of the inside of that V and that, that tusk form would pop out of that. Um, and um, I used to make these, um, a lot of these black vases that were, you know, turned and carved and embellished and they were heavily influenced by the, the art from Benin, Africa. Uh, and specifically, they would make these cast brass busts um, of ancestors, um, and they would sit on these ancestral altars. And, but coming out of the heads were these beautifully elaborately carved elephant tusks. And so uh, that's how I see those two forms as kind of being a, you know, um, abstracted tusk. And um, at the same time, I was looking for, I'm always looking for forms that allow kind of a canvas for surface embellishment or painting. And I liked, I liked the tusk kind of shape, but I like the fact that it's kind of faceted. So I get those, the corners make a nice hard line, but then the, the kind of the flattish surfaces are surfaces that I can um, embellish or texture. And um, a lot of them wind up being, kind of a really simple kind of scratched or rasped or sure formed kind of texture to get some kind of like cross hatching in the scratch marks and then painting it and sanding it back through gives it a little bit of an aged look or antique look if you want to call it that um, but then having you know having two of them uh, together in a piece makes it a relationship type piece and one being black and one being white. Um, um, one's the shadow of the other, or one's the sister or brother of the other. And, um, and those are things I didn't really think about the pieces until they were done. Uh, um, and I kind of talked about that before. Like, I was more interested in just this form and what I could do with the form. And then 
the, the closer I got to finishing it, the more uh, I started to have these ideas about what the piece might actually mean to me, as opposed to starting with an idea, like making a piece about siblings or relationships. And to me, that kind of comes towards the end. Uh, sometimes, most of the time, not always, but most of the time. Um, and then the other piece you have, it's another kind of relationship piece that I started making uh, in 2012. I made the first kind of version of that. And, um, and then I think this is another good example of how my mind works when I'm, when I'm making stuff and where the ideas come from. But I, I've been in a residency for, for four months at uh, SUNY Purchase in New York. And it was coming to the end of the residency. And I never had four months to just work on my sculpture before. And it was amazing. It was amazing the time. And, and we were all there, my whole family, my wife and two kids were there on campus. And, um, and I'd, been, I'd been saving all of my drops, all of my scraps, all my cutoffs. And I had these two kind of slabs, like very thin slabs. Um, that had been cut off of the larger piece. Um, and it still had the bark on it. And I took my saw and took a, and just cut half the bark away on the ones on the, on the bark side, I cut half of that surface away. And when I steamed the bark off, I had this beautiful line between my chainsaw cut and then the outside surface of the tree, you know, just beneath the bark. And it was just this beautiful loose line that was just, it was great because I, I only had so much say in that. You know, I, I controlled my cut with the saw, but the tree was bringing, you know, it was bringing in its influence over that line as well. So where that line is, is to me, that's where my work and the tree came together, literally. Uh, and it occurred to me, you know, that that's exactly like having kids. Like, I mean, I brought something to the, to the kids, but they show up with their own stuff as well. So uh, I had two of these and uh, the kids were six and eight at the time. So I perforated one with six holes and then the other one with, with eight holes and, and put them together. And then I've done, well, and the kids kind of insisted I do one for them every year. So seven and nine and eight and 10. And I can't remember, that's like 12 and 14 or something. They're 14 and 16 now, but now they're just getting too tall. I can't, I can't <laughs> But that's kind of where that that type of piece came from, and the uh, the square holes are fun because they're initially you drill I drill the hole with the drill bit, and then I heat up a, an iron and I burn it. Uh, so it's a square iron, and I burn the round hole square, which is not necessary. You can cut a square hole, but it's fun uh, because the pieces are then burned. Um, I like it because it's it's a uh, it's a little bit looser, and uh, and some of my you know I, I can be very tight in my work, and I'm always trying to find ways to kind of trick myself into working a little bit bit looser and not as precise. So burning things is one way to really soften the work mm -hmm. and, and give it a looser feel. And uh, um, yeah, and it's it's another one of those ways where it's kind of you're collaborating with the material, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you you know you start this process out, but then it kind of has its own way that it finishes on its own terms with the fire or with you uh, trimming that bark off in that way. Um, so that's really like that's a really cool story behind that piece. And I was always I've just been very interested in that one in particular because there is so much depth to it. And the contrast, I mean, you have the dark paint, but the contrast between the burns and the dark paint, it makes it even, the darkness even more accentuated in the burns. And yet your work is so textural. Um, it has so much feel to it. And it's pretty interesting because it's got so much texture and feel to it without relying on the wood grain itself. We have so much other work here that has, you know, the, the texture is coming from embellished, like accentuating the natural grain in it. And by yeah. you painting it and scratching it and carving and uh, burning it, you're, not, you're kind of 
taking the attention away from the grain, but still like at uh, showing off the texture of the material. Yeah, I like to think of it. That's a good way to put it. Um, yeah, and I've been asked by people who are a little more maybe wood purist if if maybe maybe I I should use another material or why don't I use another material? I guess is how they come. But it's you know I like how wood behaves. I like like it gives the right amount of resistance. And I've done some metal work and I've I've played with clay and and they clearly don't suit my personality. You know, like the, the wood is like it's just it's just the right amount of resistance uh, that I can that I can work with. And um, and I agree. Like I agree. There's more to the wood than the qualities of wood there's more to it than just the grain that you see you know um and i like i like finding techniques like burning that take advantage or can accentuate parts of the grain if you burn if you burn a wood like ash or oak it'll actually accentuate the grain for you because there's a soft and a hard layer to every growth ring and when you burn uh that those woods that that soft layer gets burned away faster than the hard layer and it, you can really accentuate the grain of of those uh, species so uh, that's to me that's fun where a, a very simple technique uh, combined with a particular type of wood can create a, a an interesting effect mm -hmm. yeah that's uh that's really cool Thank you so much for uh, taking some time out of your day for me to just kind of take me through your process and uh, give me some more insight into your work. I really appreciate it, Mark. Oh, no problem. I'm, I'm glad to do it. It's a pleasure to be in the exhibition.